you have a Bible, why don't you turn to uh, Philippians chapter 3, where I'm going to be reading from, and I'm going to be reading verse 1 through to 14. Uh, But just as we come to that, just so I can set this up for us a little bit, explain where we're going, uh, we've been looking during the the month of March, focusing on the four P, um, which is the prophecy, the promise that beckons the Lord to the Isaiah. 54 and realized from that that um, we're a place to grow. Right? Then we came to our priorities, which is the reason that we exist. And we saw that our priorities, the reason we exist, are threefold. We're a place to grow in loving Jesus and encountering the presence of God. Uh, in other words, worship. We're a place to grow in living for Jesus and following Jesus. In other words, discipleship. Uh, and we're a place to grow in Uh, bringing and leading other people to make space to lead people to Jesus. And so we're a place to grow in in mission. Then out of that, we have our purpose, which we looked at last week. uh, And we began to see that there was a measure of overlap at this point because the purposes flow into the priorities and seek to uphold the priorities. And we know our purpose statement, Kingswood Baptist Church, is a fellowship of Christians committed to being and making disciples of Jesus Christ. And there's three things that we identify there. We, we want to be family, we want to be disciples, and we want to make disciples, bring people to know Jesus. As we do that, it will uphold our priorities. And this morning, we're, we're coming to our pursuit. And again, there's a change in language here. I think previously we'd speak about values, but the, the, in, in many ways, the values that we, we had sort of marked out and stuff were very generic. You could have applied them to any church. And so what we've sought to do is identify things that will, will feed into the priorities and the purpose so that we, we do move towards becoming a, a place to grow. So to give you an example of this, uh, one of our pursuits, which we'll look at in a moment, is we pursue relationships. Um, and we do that because our purpose is to be a family, uh, because it's in this context that the priorities of worship, discipleship, and mission can flourish. You see, that they, they all move. All of these things move in the same direction for us. Um, so that kind of sets us up. And let me read to you from Philippians chapter 3, 1 to 14, uh, and then we'll explore this together. Paul writes to the church in, Fi- in Philippi. He says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ. And the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or I have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it but one thing i do forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead i press on towards the goal to win the prize for which god has called me heavenward in christ jesus what an incredible passage of scripture right it is just amazing um when i used to work in in hotels and restaurants we'd often have receptions and you know where people would gather and network and that sort of thing and rather than having a sit-down meal what they would do is they would they would order the, the sort of drinks and that sort of thing and then they'd order canapes uh, and then as waiters we would go around with these trays of canapes and on the tray there would be these kind of little finger bite food like this you know it's about so big uh, that people would just be able to pick as you went past and that sort of thing and there'd be a huge variety of different canapes that you would have and 
And maybe you take one that's got a little piece of a white crostini with a little bit of olive oil and some salt sprinkled on it. And then maybe it's got some nice parma ham with a chutney or something. And you pop that in your mouth and you, you chew that. And you get all these flavors that kind of go through your mouth and everything like that. But you get a taste, you get a flavor, and it leaves you wanting more. All right? It leaves you wanting more. That's what this morning is going to hopefully be. Like, all right? I, I, I was trying to think, how do, I, how do I talk about our purposes? There's six of them. You know, how am I going to kind of capture this all in, in, in one shot? And, and with, really, each pursuit deserves a sermon on its own that we can then digest and get into. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a canopy. All right? I'm going to give you just a little taste, which as you taste it and savor it, you'll think, oh, I want to know more about that. And then you'll be able to take Unpack the Preach this week, and you'll be able to study a little bit deeper about what does this mean for me, how does this impact me, and so on. Does it make sense? All right, so here's a whole lot of different little canapes for you, uh, and it begins with looking at uh, what it actually means to pursue something. That's what we need to settle first, because it's, it's okay to say, okay, these are our pursuits, but what does that mean exactly for us? And, and Paul's passage here in, in Philippians chapter 3 just gives us a beautiful picture into this, an idea of what, it, what does it mean for us to pursue. As you, you cast your eyes down the passage, certain things come to the, to the forefront. To, to pursue means to have a specific goal in mind. Verse 10, Paul says, I want to know Christ. That's Paul's very specific goal that he has in mind, which always blows my mind. Whenever I read that verse, I think to myself, how can Paul say that? I mean, that, this is Paul that we're talking about. Paul that meets the risen Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road. Paul that writes most of the New Testament. Paul that reflects back on the cross and explains to us the theology of the cross and the how we put it into practice in our lives. Paul, who was able to take the gospel and apply it to people's lives in a whole variety of different contexts. If it was anybody in the New Testament who knew Jesus, it was Paul. And he's saying here, no, 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 I want to know Christ. He's got a very clear goal in mind. A clear destination that he's got marked out in his mind for him. He's single-minded in his purpose. As we pursue something, we need to have a goal in mind. Otherwise, you'd be running this way and that way. You need to know where it is that you're going. The second thing about pursuing is that you need to acknowledge that you ha haven't arrived yet. Right? If you're chasing something, it means that you're still in progress, right? You haven't actually got there yet. And Paul says, I think it's in verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained all of this. Which, again, just blows your mind. Because here's Paul who knows Jesus intimately, and he's saying, I haven't arrived yet. You know, in other words, there's still more to know about Jesus. There's still more to grow in Jesus. There's still more to experience in a relationship with Jesus, walking with Him and, and, and following Him. It's like a good relationships and, or good friendships, good marriages. You know, they just, over the years, they, you never get to the stage where you say, okay, we've got it all sussed. It's like, no, no, we just go deeper and deeper and deeper in love and connection and that sort of thing. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I haven't arrived yet. If we're pursuing something, we haven't arrived yet. Number three about pursuing is to pursue means to let go of one thing or direction to pursue another. And this is captured in verses through 4 through to verse 9. At, at verse 4, Paul kind of gives his CV, doesn't he? He gives this, kind of talks about all the different accolades that he has. I was, you know, I'm of the, the tribe of, I'm from Israel, and I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, you know, so I've got a good heritage, and I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, um, and that sort of thing. I'm a Pharisee, and what have you. He talks about all these accolades. I mean, this was the direction that his life was going in. Um, if memory serves me correctly, Paul was a, a disciple of uh, Gamaliel, who was this famous teacher and you know, rabbi and, and that sort of thing. So his whole life, he's come up top in his class in studying and learning. He's become a disciple of this, you know, this well-known and well-respected uh, um, uh, teacher and rabbi. His, his life is moving in this direction. He's a Pharisee. All these things, all these things to boast about, all these things to talk about. And then you get to verse 7 and he says, do you know what? It's all rubbish. It's all rubbish in comparison to knowing Jesus. It doesn't even compare. It doesn't even come close. Everything that I was pursuing, everything I was pouring my life into, now I've met Jesus. Do you know what? It, there's this change of direction. You know, sometimes we, 
we try to do both, don't we? <laughs> we try to do both. We want, we want to, yes, I want to follow Jesus, but I, I kind of want to go this way as well. And we try and do kind of both. And actually, it, it requires, if we're going to pursue something, it's going to require a change of direction. Sometimes that change of direction will begin with that great positive word, repentance. We need to turn away from one thing in order to pursue something else. Another thing about pursuing is it means to invite opposition. All right? Paul says in verse 2, he says, Watch out for those dogs, those mutilators of the flesh. All right, what he's got in mind here is a, a group of people, that Paul talks about them in his letter to the Galatians as well, the Judaizers who were going, kind of following behind Paul, I guess, or coming to places where Paul had planted the church. And they were saying, that So Paul would have gone in and preached and said, salvation is by grace through faith in Christ Jesus alone. That's it. But they were coming along and saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus plus circumcision. So you need to also be circumcised. They'd be saying to the Gentile believers, you, you guys, you also need to be circumcised. Okay, so, And then that equals salvation. And, and Paul warns and he says, listen, watch out for them because they, they will take you astray. They will lead you astray. And if we make a choice to pursue the pursuits that we've had, it's, it will be to invite opposition. And then those dogs could be anything that is metaphoric for anything that will distract us, anything that will deflect us, anything that will draw us away from pure devotion to Christ and pursuit of these things that we see personified in Christ and in the life of Paul as well. So it's to invite opposition. To pursue means to forget what is behind I love verse 13. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on, says Paul. It's just so good, isn't it? I remember when I was um, at school, uh, I used to do athletics and stuff in, in the summer, and you'd be running, and the coach would always say stuff to us. He'd say, stick in your lane and don't look back. Run in your lane as fast as you can and don't look back. Now, it was never a problem for me because I was always at the back, so there was nobody... Get, okay, But the idea was, you know, if you're out in the front and you're running really fast in the front, you don't turn around and look back and see where everybody else is because the moment you do that, you break your stride, you slow down, you might even stumble and fall, and you might run out of your lane, etc. No, no, you just keep your eyes straight forward right, without any looking back over you. Don't worry about what's happening behind you. Just press on towards what is ahead. Many Christians spend so much of their lives looking back behind them. I wonder what difference it would have made in Paul's life if he had done that. If he had constantly looked back behind him, I was a persecutor of the church. Oh no, I, was, I, I, I threw people in jail. I, I stood there approving of St Stephen's murder. If he was constantly looking back, would he have been as effective for the kingdom? I, I doubt it. But he says, that I'm forgetting what is behind. And that's good advice because there's nothing you can do about what is behind you. What's done is done. You can't change it. All right, so you stop looking behind and press on towards what is ahead. And I, I wonder this morning if this isn't a word for somebody. That you need to stop looking over your shoulder at what's behind past regrets, past mistakes, past whatever. I actually just say, do you know what? Today I'm leaving that behind me and, and from this day forward I'm, I'm pressing on. I'm straining forward in the language that Paul uses. I'm pressing on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's what it means to pursue. Right? You've got a kind of picture and a flavor in your mind. It's going to require devoted time. It's going to require energy. It's going to require clarity. It's going to require regular attention. It's going to require sustained habit. We're going to talk about that in May. It's going to require vigilance against drifting. It's going to require our catchword. It's going to require being intentional. So with this picture of what it means to pursue in our minds, drawing from Philippians chapter 3, let me just walk you through as quickly as I can. Remember, this is just a little canopy. You're just getting a little taste, which should whet your appetite and want to come back for more, all right, to explore this deeper. These are our six pursuits, firstly, and they're in no particular order, okay? They're just the way they are in the car when we put them together. Um, number one, we pursue an encounter with God. Through worship and prayer and scripture, both corporately and individually, because encountering God changes us. 
This is where it all starts for Paul. Acts chapter 9. There he is, breathing out his murderous threats against the church. He's got in his fist the, the stuff that he's going to take so they can go and take Christians and put them into jail. And he's on the Damascus Road. I, I guess he's going so quickly, there's a bit of a dust trail that's coming up behind him. You know, as he's walking along, all the things he's going to do to the church and what have you. And then all the risen Lord Jesus meets him. And there's this blinding light that is around him and he's driven to his knees and he hears this voice and he asks this great question. <laughs> he says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. And then after that, he gets up and Paul, who saw things so clearly, who saw things with such great clarity about what he was about, now he's blind. And he's got to be led He's not going to be leading anybody to jail. He's got to be led blind to this house on Straight Street where he, he prays. And I, I wonder if it's in, see, it's not, maybe just not just the moment where he's um, on his knees in the, the road to Damascus. Maybe it's in these three days that he prays and that he fasts. That he encounters the overwhelming grace of God. So that later on he could write to the Philippians and say to them, Hey man, you know, all of that, my life before, it's just rubbish in comparison to knowing this Jesus. And the encounter changes him. And he's never the same again. A radical change of direction in his life. And I've said it many, many times before. I, I believe passionately that it is impossible to encounter the presence of God and remain the same. One of two things will happen. Either your heart will be gripped by God. And it will lead to a change of your heart and a renewing of your mind and a change of your life and the way that you live. Either it will lead in that direction or it will lead to a hardness of heart as you resist God and resist God and resist God. But you never remain the same. It is impossible to encounter the presence of God and simply just remain the same. Either it's hardness of heart or even a, either it's a tenderness of heart towards God. And wherever you look in Scripture and throughout church history, you see this again and again and again. People encountering God. Moses at the burning bush. Ezekiel as he had his supernatural call to be a prophet. Uh, John Wesley as he's, after listening to a treatise on, on Romans 8, and he's walking down Aldergate Street in, in, in London. It's quite surreal. You can actually go to the spot and there's a plaque on the wall by the church. And you can stand and you can think, this is where John Wesley had his heart strangely warmed. He wasn't praying for it, wasn't looking for it, nothing. He just encountered God in this moment, and the Methodist revival was birthed in that place. It changed the course, historians will say, of English history. Or Evan Roberts, just in a place of prayer, coming under this deep burden to want to pray for the churches. And it led to this outpouring. And, and the great thing about this, it's, it's going to look different for all of us. All right, there's no set way to say this is what an encounter with God looks like. No, it's going to be different for each of us because God knows you and God knows how to relate to you and God knows how to get to your attention. And so for some people, they're going to say, I, I encounter God when I, I, when I worship, when I sing His praise and I declare His greatness. That's when I encounter and sense really near the, the, the presence of God. And for others, they're going to say, well, it's, it's, in, it's in my prayer closet. When I'm on my knees and I just get overwhelmed by the presence of God so that I can't even talk anymore as the tears stream down my face, that's when I encounter God. And for others, they'll say, no, 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 it's when I open His Word and I, I read it and it's like almost every word is speaking to me and I just I sense God's love and His kindness and His grace and His challenge and His rebuke and it's food for me and it strengthens me and it encourages me. It looks different for all of us. We pursue an encounter with God because when we encounter Him, whether it's through word, spirit, it leaves us changed. And we need to be changed, no? We pursue a positive life balance, number two, which incorporates worship, prayer, scripture, work, and service, and adequate rest because these are the means and the tools that God has given us to grow. It's obvious from Paul's letters that you realize in the book of Acts, you realize here is a guy that's got a phenomenal work ethic. I mean, he's not lazy, right? There's nothing about Paul's letters that you can say, man, I think this guy wasn't pulling his weight. You know, everything about it, just he's got this incredible 
work ethic. He works, he says, I work hard for the Lord. In spite of incredible opposition that he faced and difficulties and setbacks that he faced, he works incredibly hard for the Lord. But even amongst that, he's got margins. Even though he's working hard for the Lord, I think Paul's somebody who had margins. He wasn't all about letter writing, letter writing. He had space for prayer. He wasn't all about planting churches, planting churches. He had time to say to people, look, I'm going to come visit you and I'm going to stay with you for a while. And I think the secret for Paul was that his starting place was he put God first. And everything else in his life fitted because he put God first. And what we sometimes try to do is we try to put everything else in first and then tack God on the, back, on the end of it. So maybe it's a little bit like your mobile phone contract. I don't know if you've got a mobile phone contract, some of them you can get add-ons. You know? So you get X amount of data and uh, minutes and that sort of thing. But if you run out, you can like, okay, I, I just want an add-on. You know, another two gigabytes of data or another thousand text messages or whatever the case may be. And we sometimes approach our relationship with God in the same way. We're like, no, no, I've got got all this stuff and I've got this package, but I want God as an add-on. I'm just going to bolt him on the end here and if if I've got space and time for him, then I'll do that. That doesn't lead to a positive life balance. We put God first and then after that, everything else is kind of arranged after that. When we did our um, the elders did the pastoral mornings back in 2017 or something like that, one of the things that came out is we we met everybody in the co- in the congregation, all those that were in membership. We had an hour with people just listening, praying. One of the the major things that came out of that was the overwhelm and busyness that people were feeling and were experiencing in life. Just overwhelmed with, with work, with family life, with stuff, with church, with this. And, and the results of this, you know, where this leads to is people getting um, burnt out, disillusioned, and eventually giving up. And it, it's not just a church thing. It's a cultural thing. We live in a very busy, fast-paced culture. But we need to pursue something different. We need to model something different. We need to be people, men and women, who say, no, no, God first. And everything else gets ordered around that. We have been created to live and love and serve and worship from a place of rest, not a place of exhaustion. So we pursue a positive life balance. Number three, we pursue relationships. Through intentionally connecting with the church family via Sunday gatherings, small groups and serving, because God has made us for relationships to care for one another. I don't know about you, but... uh, I'm fascinated by chapters in the Bible like Romans 16 and Colossians chapter 4. They're often chapters that people get to and they're just like, ah, it's a bunch of names, we'll just skip over that. We'll go, to, go on, to the, on to the next thing. But it's fascinating because here's Paul writing to the church in Rome and he names 26 or 28 different people. And he's like, greet this person, send them my love. This one's a relative, that's a friend. They've been good at working alongside me and they've been a help to me in my ministry, etc., etc., etc. And you're like, Paul knows so many people. And not just in, they're not just like friends on Facebook, you know, that, that they met once and now they're like friends. No, they're just people he cares about. He's named them in his letters. And you see the same thing in Colossians chapter 4 and a similar sort of thing in 2 Timothy in the, in the closing chapters. Paul knows all these people. So here's this busy church planter, but he's still got time to make connection with people. He's still building friendships with people. He's still building relationships with people. And before you think, okay, so that means I need to be friends with lots of people in church, and then I'm okay, it didn't stop there for Paul. Paul wasn't just, this is where people sometimes do stop, all right? We we only have friends in church. And nobody outside of church. But Paul didn't stop there. He had friends outside of church as well. You go through the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19. There's that big riot that breaks out in Ephesus. And the whole city rushes down to the amphitheater. And they're all shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians and that sort of thing. And Paul's standing at the bottom where there's this tunnel that was there. And he's saying to the people with me, let me go out and speak to them. Can you imagine? And they scream, and they, they, they'd rip him limb from limb. But he's like, no, let me have 
oh, this is a great opportunity for the gospel. Let me just go and speak to them. I want to go and talk to them. And a message comes through to him from one of the officials of the city who isn't a Christian. And Luke includes in verse 31 of chapter 19, a friend of Paul's. Paul didn't just hang out with Christians. He hangs out with those that weren't yet Christians. Right, and built connection with them. The same thing happens when you read later on in the chapter when he's in the book when, when he's moving from Jerusalem to Rome. Luke mentions the name of the centurion guard who's guarding them, Lysias. I think if memory serves me correctly, his name is. And, and it describes how this guard, centurion, shows Paul great favor and great kindness. Why would he do that? Probably because Paul each morning said, How you doing? Fist bump. All right. Uh, praying for you today. All right. How's the family and everything like that? Anything you need? Is there anything that I can do for you? you know? He's building this connection with this guy. And I think the reason that Paul does that is because Paul understood that the gospel moves through relationships. There's nothing wrong with some of the, the, the work that we do in terms of distributing leaflets and door knocking and, and that sort of thing. That's all seed sowing, all right? and it's important. But the gospel moves through relationships. The gospel message of Jesus Christ moves through relationships. And Paul knew that. Paul connects with people. And so we pursue relationships. And again, you see how this begins to get interwoven and intertwined because... Well, you can only have space for relationships if you're pursuing a positive life balance so that you've got margin in life to build relationships with people, right? So it all begins to kind of come to Paul, the great prolific church planter and theologian, still makes time. He's not too aloof and too distant. He still makes time to build relationships with people. Number, I think we're at four. Four. You getting full yet with your little canapes? Are you still hungry for more? Yeah, okay. All right, good. All right, we pursue generosity through investing in the church, both through sacrificial and cheerful financial giving and investing our time using our gifts to build the church because God has given so generously to us. We pursue generosity. There's a strange thing that I sometimes, I've come across in church um, where we sometimes think with an either-or mentality. So people will say things like, um, I give financially to the church, but I don't serve in the church. Or, I serve in the church and use my gifts in the church, but I don't give financially to the work of the kingdom. As if doing the one excuses you from the other. So I, I, it's like either or, and you don't see that in Jesus' teachings. You don't see that in the life of Paul and his teaching. It's not an either or, it's both and. Right? The, the passage we're going to look at in a couple of weeks as we look at discipleship and, and money will be 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. And, and here Paul explains to the church, you know, talks about the, the joy of giving and encourages their generosity and lays down certain principles. He says, your giving, as you give, it needs to be proportionate. So, so what you have, your giving needs to be proportionate to that. It needs to be systematic. Uh, in his first letter to the Corinthians, he says, listen... Do a collection each week so that when I come, it's not going to catch you by surprise. You know, so do this. Be systematic about this. Uh, give sacrificially. Right? And above all, give cheerfully. Right? Give cheerfully. Um, but he doesn't stop there in terms of talking about financial giving. If you read through his other letters, he will say things like, Imitate me as I imitate Christ Jesus. And then he talks about the example that he's setting about how he works hard, how he serves hard. So he's not just about kind of uh, saying, no, no, you give and then you don't need to worry about serving. Paul's saying, no, no, we do both. And both of these things he then grounds in the gospel. So he says, for, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was rich. For your sake he became poor so that through his poverty you might become rich. Paul connects our giving to the gospel. He connects our giving to the cross. But at the same time, he connects our service in the cause of the kingdom to the cross as well. Because all we have to do is look at the cross and see how God has served us in Christ Jesus so magnificently. And that should then compel us to want to serve others in the same way. It's not an either or. It's a both and. And as I say, we'll explore this in a bit more detail as we look at discipleship and 
giving and money in a couple of weeks' time, but we pursue generosity. How's God going to stretch us here? How's God going to stretch us here? Number five, we pursue personal witness through our front line, always ready to share our story and praying specifically for people to come to faith because this is the commission that Christ gave us. This is again going to be an area of shift in our thinking, I think, um, in the years ahead. You know, we may not all be gifted evangelists, all right? um, but we've all been given the commission to go and make disciples. So in other words, tell people about Jesus. And again, through the book, uh, through, through Paul's letters, you, you pick up certain things that just kind of that encourage us in this. You know, we, we can't all be gifted evangelists, but we can, like Paul, know the gospel. Right? Know the gospel message and how it applies to people's lives. Right? So, that, so that we can share it with them. So that when people say things to us like, there's some, I feel like there's something missing in our lives that we're ready to respond to them and talk to them about Jesus and how God fulfills the longing in each human heart. You know, when, when people say, talk about how they've messed up, to then talk about the impact of sin and that sort of thing. If we had, and again, here, it, this is why we pursue relationships, because if you have a relationship with somebody, it, it, in one sense, it gives you the credibility and the permission, if you like, to speak into somebody's life in this way. You can't talk to exact, you know, complete strangers in this way. It just doesn't have the same impact. Well, you can, you know, but do you know what I mean? So we've got to know the gospel, but then also we've got to know our own story. Right? How it is that God has moved in our lives. I, I love it in the later part of book, the book of Acts when Paul stands before kings and officials, a fulfillment of the prophecy that Ananias uh, spoke over him, that he would be a witness before kings and officials. And he stands there and he just tells his story. This is, how I met, this is who I was. This is how I met Jesus. This is the impact it's had on my life. This is how I'm living for Jesus. It's so simple. So simple. He knows his story and he's ready to share his story. You also see, and also one of the things I mentioned in the, the, the bit at the beginning about praying specifically for people. You also see in Paul's example, he's constantly writing to the churches. As, well, as he's writing to the churches, he's constantly saying, pray for me. Pray for me that whenever I open my mouth, I can proclaim the gospel as I ought to. Pray for me that a door would open up so that I can go and preach the gospel. I'm experiencing great opposition in this particular place, which means a door of opportunity is open for me, he says in one of his letters. So pray for me. Right? So, so if we, we need to, who are the people on your front line? The place where you spend most of your time with those who are not yet Christians, that you can pray for. Specifically, bring them to God by name and say, God, would you open their eyes to the truth of your gospel? Would you soften their heart to your love? Would you unstop their ears? Would you undermine the lies of the enemy and help them to hear truth? God, would you give me perseverance as I walk patiently with them through this? We pursue personal witness. I said it a couple of weeks ago in, in, uh, in another service. You know, one. Again, this is where a shift is going to need to take place. You know, we, we've often relied as a church on, on a, a team of people, the evangelism team, who, who do whole, you know, organize events that we have at church and, and that sort of thing by a few people um, that are then attended largely by Christians. And we, we think, okay, we're doing evangelism. And that needs to change. We need to all grasp responsibility for this. All of us know people who don't know Jesus. All of us have a front line, whatever it might be, whether it's for family, whether it's friends, where it's a place, a hobby, or whatever the case may be, whether it's at school, or whether it's at university. We, we all have a front line, a place where we can be ambassadors for Jesus. And the final one is we pursue a life of sacrifice through picking up our purpose, our cross, and following Jesus because this is what we believe it means to follow Jesus. And this one's really short, because we've covered this earlier on during the year. But this one, if at any point during what I've said over the last half an hour, you've thought to yourself, nah, nah that sounds like too much hard work. Oh, I was pursuing stuff I just don't think 
up for that. All right? This one comes back and encourages us. We live a life of sacrifice. It's, it's not about what, what, what we want, what we like. It's about following Jesus with obedience. I was talking to um, Stuart the other day, having a conversation and catch up with him. We were talking about discipleship in the church. and He, he was saying to me, something I'm still pondering, but he, he said to me, he said, discipleship really just comes down to one word, obedience, full stop. That's it. Either you listen to the voice of God, you listen to the word of God, you listen to what Scripture says, or you don't. If you are listening, well, that's discipleship. If you're not, I'm not sure what it is, but it's not discipleship. I'm not, I haven't thought of what to call it. Uh, do you remember Luke chapter 9, verse 23? That great, broad invitation. If anyone, anyone, all are welcome. If anyone would come after me, they must pick up their cross daily and follow me. Immediately afterwards, Jesus goes to say, and this way, living this way, you will find life. If you try to organize it any other way, you will lose your life. But if you do it this way, you will find life. That's it. Canapes are all served. You've had, I was going to say you've had enough. No, maybe not. You're supposed to be hungry at this point. You want to go and explore and think about these things a little bit further. And, and to this end, we've, we've put together, you'll begin to see these around the church and, uh, and that sort of thing. These postcards are available at the front of the church. The four Ps in the detail sort of broken down uh, are on here, captured on here. On the reverse of this, we've also got uh, scriptures as well, which kind of anchor all the thoughts that we've been sharing, as well as prayer points and that sort of thing. And we'd encourage you to be emailed out this week, and we would encourage you to pick one up here at the hard copy of the church, just to keep in your Bible so that you can pray as you read scripture, you can pray through those things, all in preparation for us adopting and sort of acknowledging this at our June church meeting. Um, but as we respond to God's word now in, in worship, let me just close by saying, I, I hope, I long for us, I pray for us, I earnestly seek God for us, that we would be a people who run the race with perseverance. There's a race that God has marked out for us. And we've stumbled and we've deviated and, at times, but the road is pretty clear ahead of us, I think. And I pray that we would be men and women who will earnestly, eagerly pursue Him. That we'd throw off everything that hinders and the sin that's so easily entangled. And we'd run the race that is marked out for us with great perseverance, with great joy. For our good and for His glory. Amen.